Hi, Molly. Hey. The light came in when the power went out. What can, what can you tell me about that line? Um, that line came about, I got home from tour one time and my roommates had forgotten to pay the electric bill and all Is the power tr- was out in the house. Really? <laughs> yeah, so I wrote that down in my phone. I wrote power went out. I thought for some reason that struck me as an interesting line for a song. And I have all these notes in my phone of different song ideas. Right. Um, and then my friend Maya DeVitri came over a couple weeks after that. And we just sat in my bedroom and came up with the chorus for that song. I just got an electric guitar and we were just kind of jamming on that chorus for a while. Um, And then Ryan Hewitt, who produced When You're Ready, we got together and I played him the chorus and he thought we should flesh it out and write some verses. So Mm. we finished the song almost a year later. I'm I'm reluctant to ask too much about like, what does that mean? But I'm I'm Mm -hmm. just curious about that that line, you know, that uh, I'm, I'm guessing out of, you know, something... Those things seem opposite, uh, oppositional, yeah. right? That the light would come in when the power went out. Mm-hmm. I'm, I'm assuming it has some kind of grander meaning. Yeah. Other than just your roommate remembered to pay the light bill. <laughs> totally. Well, I mean, yeah, that's what sparked the idea for just part of that line. But I think the line to me, um, just in my life, I feel so distracted by technology and all these things we have um, shown to us on a daily basis on our phones or on TV or just out in the world. And I think... That line to me just means when it's all stripped away, you can mm. really see what's important and maybe see the other person. And um, like when the power comes out in your house, you get all the natural light from outside in the world. So you see what's real. And um, yeah, I think it can, that line to me has a bunch of different layers to it. It's also the word power is, um, I feel like so many times in our world and among friends or even on a larger scale and in like the political world, there's such a power struggle and sometimes that just has to fall away for you to really see someone else or see what's real. That's, it's, it's beautiful. Um, I want to talk about you as a, as a musician just for a second. So I'm going to talk about your family in just a moment. But first, mm-hmm. I want to talk about you a, as a guitar player because you're ob- obviously an exceptional one. But So when you first started to learn guitar, like what was the, what was the first song you learned on guitar? I remember my dad teaching me this fiddle tune, Cripple Creek, and that was my very first tune you're taking the capo off can you, can you play <laughs> yeah. can you, do you remember how to play it like how you would have played it back then yeah i think i can do a little demonstration so um yeah just really simple version of the tune that i would probably be similar to the first um when i learned it for the first time would be like so did you learn flat picking before you learned chording I think the first chord I ever learned, so I learned some simple chords and then I started flat picking a little bit, but it was around the same time. And I remember the first chord I learned was just a one finger G chord. Oh, yeah. Just this. The old standard. Yeah, yeah. Just learning to pick strum. So, yeah. Is it, is it, because you're, I'm assuming you learned from your dad, your dad, Jack Tuttle, one of mm-hmm. the most accomplished, kind of renowned bluegrass teachers, great musician too, but a bluegrass teacher mm-hmm. in, in the American um, Southwest. And, um, is that an is that an interesting dynamic to like have your father as a teacher? Yeah, it was a different dynamic because I had taken music lessons before on piano and violin, and nothing really stuck. And it always seemed kind of like a chore that I had to practice. Um, so I, I think when I started learning from my dad, it just happened more naturally. And I was interested in guitar, so he brought home like a little baby Taylor guitar, and then every now and then I'd be like, "Hey, I want to." learn a chord or learn a new tune or I just pick up the guitar and start playing and he would show me something so it didn't feel like really like a chore anymore it felt just like a fun thing that I could do when I when I wanted to right because because you were in and there was a family band for a while right yeah later on when I was 15 and maybe 14 15 we had a family band and we would play mostly around California every now and then we'd get a festival somewhere else and fly out but we never really toured we just had handful of gigs throughout the year. I mean, I, with all respect, like I just imagine that a 14, 15 year old for the most part would, the last thing they'd ever want to do <laughs> is, you know, playing a band with their parents or, you know, <laughs> playing a band with their siblings. You might, I know when I was 14 or 15, I would have stayed in my room listening to like corn all the time. You know, and I was just like, you, you felt no, um, you felt no, you didn't feel any chore there. Like you said, I think I outgrew it after a while and it started to feel like, um, it wasn't what I wanted to do anymore, but at that age, I was really into performing, and I liked playing with my dad and brothers, and they were all really supportive of me, and I was starting to write songs, and it was fun getting to work these new songs that I'd written up with them, and yeah, they were all really receptive to um, where I was 
with my music at the time. So it was really fun. And to tell me about your first, um, you don't have to, you definitely don't have to sing me the first one, but like, <laughs> tell, tell me about your, your, your kind of first introduction to songwriting. Yeah, I started taking a songwriting class when I was in high school. A class? Yeah, I really wanted to write songs and I think I had this mental block where I was like, I don't even know where to start. I tried to write songs and I would just like throw them away before I was finished. And halfway through high school, I started taking a couple of classes at a community college nearby and they had a songwriting class. So I decided to sign up for it. And basically the teacher was like, he didn't give many guideline guidelines, but he just said, write a song each week and come back and we'll all play our songs for the class. Mm. So that really forced me to not only like start finishing songs, but play them for other people. So that really helped me get the songs to a point where I felt good about them. What were you writing about? I was writing about kind of angsty teenage stuff, like crushes I had and thinking about going off to college and leaving my friends and stuff like that. So it became an avenue of, of kind of personal expression, which because <laughs> I guess like listening to the record, it still feels yeah. like an incredibly personal record. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's just evolved in that way. And a lot of my favorite songwriters write really personal songs. So that's something I've worked on is just trying to add in those personal details and touches so people get an idea of who I am. I guess I'm, tr I'm trying to figure out how to ask you this, but like, I, I can't quite get the words to, to, mm -hmm. together for it. But like, I just see some of that. Sometimes I see these two things as sort of separate, you know, like virtuosic instrumental playing, which you can obviously do. Mm -hmm. And then like very personal songwriting. And I feel like historically mm -hmm. in country music and bluegrass music, these two things were incredibly separate. Mm -hmm. But That's I, 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 but I kind of like that you've never felt like any kind of, you, you can kind of do both. You can, there's no division between the two. Right. Yeah. I guess both things are, important to me and resonate with me and I think a lot of my favorite musicians like Bill Monroe virtuosic and he wrote incredibly personal songs and that sort of songwriting really appeals to me Hazel Dickens was another one of my heroes early on when I was listening to mostly bluegrass and old-time music and her songs were just so personal so but then you had people taking like ripping solos on them in between. So it all kind of went together for me. So so when you then, you know, you mentioned Hazel Dickens, one of, the, one of the greatest bluegrass musicians and singers and songwriters of all time, Bill Monroe, the guy who you could say kind of helped create the whole thing, right? Mm -hmm. um, both performers at the Grand Ole Opry. Um, I know when I went to see you at the night at the Opry, it was your second performance. Yeah. But I can only imagine that the, the first night you played on that kind of mm -hmm. hallowed stage was been really meaningful to you. It was, yeah, it was amazing. What do you remember from that night? Um, I remember it was with my band that I'd played with for like the past year. And, um, I mean, I'd played with Wes who played banjo with me for even longer. And it just felt like a really special moment that we all got to celebrate together on that stage. And I think it was all of our first times on the stage together. And it was, yeah, it was just such an honor. And I had so many friends and family who came down to support me. And I felt just really loved and supported and also when I stepped onto the stage I was thinking about how many people who inspired me who had been on that stage too. Wes from Joy Kilsara, Wes with Wes yeah, Corbett? Yeah, Wes Corbett. Yeah, and so he was he's teaching at Berkeley now. He, he was. Did, he does do some work at Berkeley. Yeah, when I went to Berkeley he was teaching and then he actually left Berkeley. I think he still goes back every now and then and does some teaching there, but he lives down in Nashville now. So I guess the reason I bring this up is because I was just thinking about you and you and Berkeley, like you coming out of this. You go to Berkeley College of Music, mm -hmm. which is you know, pretty much the greatest modern school, a school of modern music in the United States or in North America right now. Mm -hmm. And you, you go to the school coming from such a distinct bluegrass background. You know, your dad being this esteemed bluegrass player, you being the sort of bluegrass phenom, playing in the bluegrass family band. But you're going to the school where kids are hotshot jazz musicians, mm -hmm. rock musicians, electronic musicians. Mm -hmm. I can't, was, that a, was that a bit of a culture shock for you to walk into that room? It was a little bit um, in a lot of my classes. Like, I didn't know anything about music theory. I was really uncomfortable playing over any jazz standards. And so I just had to let go of all my ego that I may have had previously. You had a feeling, little bit maybe? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, maybe. I don't know. It was just like, I think it was pretty easy to just be like, okay, I'm a beginner here basically. And I'm going to just soak in as much as I can. Cause there's so many amazing teachers and other students. And most of the students I was playing with at the time I felt were more advanced than I was at like improvising and everyone was just working so hard. Um, so yeah, I just kind of came in with an open mind and just didn't like tried not to have an ego about it. And yeah, it was a really good experience. Though. But there were, I mean, I'm guessing there were moments in the beginning that might've felt. Yeah. I remember um, when I first got there, everyone goes to a ratings audition where they, a what? 
<laughs> they rate you, they give you four numbers. Um, I can't even remember what they rate you on now, but one of them was sight reading and one of them's like theory knowledge and technical ability. And I went in and it was all a blur. I can't even remember now what they said, but I came out and they'd handed me four ones, which is the lowest possible rating. And I didn't know, I didn't see anyone else with ratings like that. Um, and I, luckily the guitar someone at the guitar department was like, hey, this can't be right. I'm going to change it. And they bumped my numbers up a little bit. But I remember that moment just getting there for the first time. And in the first week, they gave me the lowest possible score. I was oh, like, no. oh, no. <laughs> it was definitely a wake-up call. I can, well, no, but it, it sounds like everything kind of straightened itself out. Yeah, totally. But, it's, but it sounds like it was, a, it was what college is supposed to be, like a, yeah. like a, a, a certain amount of growing and, mm -hmm. and even, even sure. musically, you know? Um, so I, I want to talk about the kind of music that you play. Like, I want to talk about the world of kind of country and, and, and bluegrass and, and Americana music. And I'm going to try my best not to classify you in any way. Because, you know, I, there's one thing I know from the kind of years of studying this kind of music is that the restrictions of the genre, not necessarily the ones put on you by yourself, but by the fans of that music can be quite limiting for artists. I mean, I, have you ever come up against that? A little bit, yeah. I guess with this new record, this is kind of one of the first times that I've really experienced more comments from fans saying like they want me to stay with bluegrass or they liked my more traditional sound that I'd been doing before. Um, so yeah, it's interesting to think about. Like I feel that same way towards certain artists that I like where I'm like, I don't want you to change. I just like what you're doing now. Oh, so you can kind of understand where yeah, they're coming from. Yeah, I kind of understand it. And especially with bluegrass, like when I listen to bluegrass, I do really like traditional bluegrass more than I like a lot of, um, more, the more modern sound. So I understand it on one hand, but it's also a funny dynamic to me where to think of like someone thinking they can dictate what an artist is doing or especially, thinking they should have a say in it. And especially a young woman artist in, in bluegrass mm -hmm. music. Yeah, I think there's a different sort of attitude towards young women in bluegrass where, I don't know, it's just interesting to think about. I mean, because I, I was thinking, I mean, you're still a young artist, and there I was, so I, I fly to Nashville, I'm going to see you that night at the Opry, mm -hmm. and I say, oh yeah, Molly, I want to go see Molly <laughs> Tuttle right on, and then I'm, I'm walking through the Country Music Hall of Fame, and I see, you know, a display <laughs> of your guitar, and like, I think one of your outfits as well, mm -hmm. um, on, a, on a mannequin. Yeah. And I guess I wondered, like, does that give you added pressure to have so much acclaim from these institutions so so young, so early in your career? Mm, yeah, I don't know. I don't feel added pressure from like the Country Music Hall of Fame or the Opry because I think the people I've met at those institutions are just so open and just love music in general. And um, I guess it does sometimes, like when they put my guitar in the exhibit, I was like, whoa, I was not expecting that. And it was a huge just honor and I was like oh am I worthy of this but um yeah I think all of it just adds to my internal like desire to get better and keep pushing myself as an artist you're not going to put that up there and go well, you know I did it it's good yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you can have a cigarette and just relax yeah not yet what did it mean to you to be the first woman to win guitar player of the year at the IBMAs it meant a lot to me, and I think like how I felt about it has kind of evolved um, since that happened. And I remember when I first got nominated, I was just so honored, and I couldn't believe that had happened. And um, I grew up in the bluegrass community, so I've just been a part of that world for so long. And to feel all the support from the IBMA voters just lifting me up in that way felt amazing. And then I started thinking about it and I was like, hmm, I don't know if any women have been nominated for this award. And then I saw somewhere that I was the first woman to even be nominated. Even be nominated. Yeah. yeah. And so that was really kind of emotional for me because I was thinking about women who I thought deserved to be nominated before. And also just thinking about like why there haven't been more women guitar players. I think girls who play guitar and want to go to bluegrass jams or enter that world there's a different sort of, you kind of have to like prove yourself, like the expectation is a little lower and it can be pretty intimidating. Mm -hmm. So I think everyone just needs to work together to support girls playing instruments and playing music in general. Is this something that's important for you as your kind of star rises in this music? It is, yeah. I don't, um, I mean, I don't think about it all the time. I yeah. think it's really like everyone's job and I like to hear 
I've been hearing more men talking out, talking about it as well. I think that once men and women kind of come together and see this as a central issue, things will start to change. I hope so. Which they are. You know, in, in, but I, I just want to say one more thing about it, which is you're part of this group also called the First Ladies of Bluegrass, yeah. which is, if I'm not mistaken, uh, in the International Bluegrass Music Association Awards, it's every woman who is the first to win at their respective instrument. Is that right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. So every every so like the the first female fiddle player yeah. to win, the first woman to win bass player of the year, and all that mm-hmm. kind of stuff. Yeah. What it was, so that must be a meaningful to you to be in a, a, in a group like that. Yeah, it's really cool, and it's it's just exciting. And we've done two shows. We played at Rocky Grass, and then at the International Bluegrass Music Association Week (IBMA), um, and it was. So many women and girls came up to us after and lots of them had tears in their eyes and it felt really meaningful just to touch people in that way and um, yeah, hopefully inspire another generation of women to play music. So, I mean, the inspiration that you give is not limited only to music. I, I want to talk, if it's okay, just a little bit about, you know, I, I want to talk about the speech you gave and I want to talk a little bit about alopecia. Yeah, sure. So this is not something I knew that much about um, mm-hmm. but before I started researching and before I got to know you oh, a little cool. bit. So just for, for people listening to this, like how does alopecia a- affect you? Yeah, um, alopecia is an autoimmune disease and it's it's a hair loss disease. So it means your immune system attacks your hair follicles. Um, And I've had alopecia since I was three. When I was three, all my hair fell out in a relatively short amount of time, and it's never grown back. So I'm wearing a wig right now, and generally on stage, I'll wear wigs. And in my day-to-day life, that's just what I like. I like wearing wigs. Um, But yeah, it's really affected me throughout my life. When I was younger, I didn't wear wigs, and I wore hats, and people often would think I had cancer or maybe would mistake mistake me for a boy a lot. And so there were just all these different assumptions I faced as a kid and as an adolescent. And so it's really important to me to just raise awareness so that um, kids with alopecia don't face as much stereotypes and just create general acceptance for people who look different or yeah, just create more compassion towards it. Well, so you wrote you wrote an essay for the music blog No Depression, talking about your life with alopecia since you were a kid and what was it like for you to perform mm-hmm. at the National Alopecia uh, Foundation. Um, so, t- t- tell me a little bit more about that. Like, why why is it so important for you to share that kind of story? Yeah, it's just something that I think not many people know about, and it's something that's really made me who I am. Um, I think I relate to people who feel like they have something that makes them different. And I used to have a lot of shame about not having hair and it was something I overcame. And um, through meeting other people who had alopecia and going to the conference for people who had alopecia and performing, I just realized that um, it's okay to look different and you get to decide what you feel good about for Mm -hmm. yourself. And I feel good about not having hair and I feel good about wearing wigs. Um, And I think everyone has something that they might feel a little bit ashamed about at times or just feel makes them different than others and um, that's okay and we just all need to be compassionate towards each other. Tell me about that performance. Yeah. Because um, I, I could just tell on Instagram, like I would just, we were, we we're friends on Instagram and I was just, like I saw you at that conference and I saw mm-hmm. you performing and I could only imagine yeah. how meaningful that was to you. Yeah, it was amazing and I think like I went there and I was like, well maybe I can play music and uplift people and I didn't realize that everyone there was going to uplift me so much more than I could even have hoped for. And it was just incredible to be surrounded by people who, like me, had lost their hair. And so many of them were really happy and didn't want to grow their hair back and just seemed they were all like radiating confidence. And that was amazing. And then I went and played music for the kids. And they have a group of really young kids, um, many of whom have lost all their hair. And it was just really cool to look at those kids and think like, that's what I looked like. And they're just so adorable and mm. so happy. Mm. And um, and I think I had this negative feeling about myself as a kid, always feeling like I was different and oh, really? looked weird. And so seeing those kids and just being like, these kids are adorable. And if I had a kid and they had alopecia, they would be so cute. And 
yeah, it was really kind of a healing moment for me. Yeah, I bet it was. You know, I was thinking about you when I, I think you posted up a photo after you were on, I think it was a cruise ship gig mm-hmm. with Jason Isbell and a couple other folks. Do you remember that, that one? Oh, yeah. Yeah, and you posted this photo and you weren't, you weren't wearing yeah. your wig and I, and I saw it and I, I just still, I mean, this is wrong of me and I'm genuinely, <laughs> regularly as a, as a white dude, just shocked by things I shouldn't be shocked about. <laughs> but I saw like a... I saw a lot of comments that were like, oh, my God, Molly, are you okay? Oh, yeah. Are mm-hmm. you sick? Is everything all right? And you took the time to go in and, and let almost every single one of them know, no, this, yeah. is, this is what's going on. Yeah, I think that was that was a little bit of a shock to me. I mean, I've experienced that reaction my whole life. And I think the combination of me looking tired after a cruise and lying in bed yeah. with also yeah. not having hair was yeah. like one step too much for people. So a lot of people were like, are you sick? Um, and I had followers who hadn't seen my other posts with alopecia. So I was kind of, I took a moment and I was like, do I want to explain this or just let it go? And then I was like, I think it'll be better if I just take the time to explain it. Cause it's important to me to raise awareness. And I mean, I know that I wish more people knew about it and didn't automatically jump to that conclusion. But the reality is that I have a lot of work to do to educate people. Yeah, but you're doing it, man. Thanks. You're doing it. I see, I saw all of your comments. I was, I was <laughs> reading every single one of them. Well, I'm, I'm so excited you're here. I want you to get, to get you to play more music. But yeah. I mean, I can only, like everyone I, I talk to uh, seems to be just in love with your music right now. I mentioned, oh, I sent you a message a little, a little while ago yeah. that Steve Earle, when he came in, was talking about how great you are. That's so sweet. You're, you've been, you're going on tour soon, opening for Jason Isbell mm-hmm. on a couple of gigs, like yeah. one of the greatest songwriters in the, in, in the world right now. Yeah, he's incredible. Um, you know, are you able to take a moment every now and then and just kind of reflect on what your life is like right now? Yeah, it feels amazing. I think after my album came out, I just felt so much like gratitude at having it out in the world. And I think just every new thing that happens this year, it's just been so exciting. And yeah, it really feels like I'm working towards something that's super important to me. I guess, and it feels like it's like a new it's the new kind of generation of young bluegrass musicians, like you mm-hmm. and you and Billy Strings and these guys in, in yeah. Nashville right now. It feels like you, you you guys are about to define what the next chapter of the music is. Yeah, it's a pretty exciting time. It's cool. Honest. Before we get going, so um, I first was introduced to your music through your like you have a really interesting strumming pattern, which is more related to like claw hammer. I, I'm hearing my producers say to me right now, just in my head, please explain what everything is, Tom. Please stop. <laughs> it's more related to like an older form of playing banjo mm-hmm. yeah uh, what they call frailing using um, um uh, why don't you do it can you, t- you tell me a little bit about this the pattern yeah. style i've just never seen anyone use this particular banjo pattern on a guitar before i saw you do it yeah totally so this is called claw hammer claw hammer style and it's usually done on the banjo i think that's where it originated and when i was a teenager i learned claw hammer banjo and it's used in like old time style music i loved gillian welch I mean, I still love Gillian Welch, but I was obsessed with her as a teenager, and I had to learn all her songs, and she does some on Clawhammer banjo. So I wanted to learn that style. So I learned this style on banjo first, and then I was at a music camp in Northern California, and um, someone showed me the style transferred onto the guitar, and that totally blew my mind. It was this guy, Michael Stadler. And um, there's a couple people out in the Bay Area who do this style, but I really don't know where the Clawhammer guitar thing came from and I've only heard a couple people do it Um, but basically the style of playing is you're strumming down with your index and middle finger you kind of make your hand to look like a claw and so you strum down and then when your hand comes back up you're plucking one of the low strings with your thumb like that and then one of the really basic patterns which is the first one I learned is called the bum ditty and that's the rhythm of it so it goes Um, and that's why you want it in an open tuning. So that's why I turn tune to be like kind of a band, similar to a banjo tuning, is you just want all those open low strings and high strings ringing the whole time. Can you do it a little sped up for us? Just to give a little yeah. example. And then the first song I ever learned with this style uses that bum ditty pattern a lot. It's um, called Little Sadie. Oops. Unreal. <laughs> Unreal. 
Uh, thanks for thanks for joining us today. What, what's the last yeah. song you're going to play? I'm going to play Take the Journey. So this is kind of in this tuning? Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, this uses that style of playing. Tell me about this song. Um, so I wrote this song with my friend Sarah Siskind, and she's an amazing songwriter. And she lives in North Carolina, but she was visit- visiting Nashville. And so we wrote this song, and I went into this tuning and was just playing it playing around with it on the claw hammer guitar and it seemed to work really well it's kind of a minory song um and to me the song is about the hero's journey and just how everyone kind of has to go through these trials in their life um but then at the end of the hero's journey you end up back home but you're changed i guess is it inspired by anything in particular not exactly i think this is one of the songs on the album that's more like a broader theme I guess I've, I guess it relates to my life, but I think it can kind of relate to everyone's life. The idea of, you know, stepping away, mm-hmm. going on an adventure. Yeah. But finding yourself back to where you mm-hmm. started from. Yeah. Totally. Cool. This is Molly Tuttle performing Take the Journey on cue. 